There's a storm across the valley The clouds are rolling in The afternoon is heavy on your shoulders There's a truck out on the four lane A mile or more away The whining of his wheel just makes it colder. Welcome to Community Forum. Today is May 14th, 2021. We're still operating by Zoom because of the pandemic. My name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, and I'm your host of Community Forum. Today, I am pleased to welcome to the program Carol Lundin, who is a garden designer, a horticultural consultant, and a native plant beak. <laughs> uh, she's all three of those wrapped into one. And uh, I met Carol at the uh, in the Easton Garden Club, and she's an Easton resident. She's also on the Easton Conservation Commission and the Easton Community Preservation Committee. So she's involved in Easton's life and and, and in the community. Uh, and she she travels in many many areas throughout the Commonwealth in order to bring her expertise to people who are interested in the environment uh, and in gardens. So welcome, Carol. Thank you, Priscilla. It's I am so delighted and excited to be here with you today. Well, we're we're so happy that you are willing to. Uh, share with us your stories uh, because they're so important. And people in Easton care about the environment and the impact that uh, certain things that we do and don't do uh, have on the environment. So uh, first, tell us a little bit about the two minute video that we're about to see. Sure, um, one of the projects I'm working on right now is uh, with a woman in Seekonk. She's a retired professor of Greek history, I believe. She's an archeologist, writer, poet. Uh, wow. And she found me on the, on the internet and she said, I need help turning my entire lawn into pollinator habit, habitat. Wow. Yep. So we started last year, about a year ago, and we're, we're making steady progress and this past Wednesday, we, we put in a witch hazel, this beautiful vase-shaped woodland plant uh, right along her side street. And it's, we're gonna build a bigger bed around it and, and create a, a native plant community around that plant. Sounds wonderful. Well, now we're going to ask Jason Daniels, executive director of uh, Easton's uh, e ECAT, um, and um, which stands for Eastern Community Access TV. And he's recording this for broadcast. So uh, do you want to, Jason, do you want to run that video for us? Hello, this is Carol Lundin of Garden 911 Boston. Today we're in Seekonk, Massachusetts, where we have a client who wants to take all of her lawn and turn it into pollinator gardens. Well, not quite all of her lawn. We will leave some mowed paths so she can get around. After all, when you own a yard, you own an ecosystem. We started about a year ago when almost this entire backyard was nothing but lawn. Now, pollinators, what do they need? They need native plants to complete their entire life cycle, just like all wildlife. So we'll be installing native trees, shrubs, vines, ferns, grasses, all kinds of different native plants and that will create an ecosystem that will help support the birds, the bees, even the squirrels we wanna support here. There's an owl just over there. Um, we just had a fern, a, a, not a fern, a wren just a minute ago. One of the many things we'll be putting in is a high bush blueberry. Many people grow blueberries, but very few grow the native species. That's not a cultivar. Oh, there's a wren. Hello, wren. Once we have the prep done, the next thing will be plant selection. 
Now, in pollinator gardens, many people think about flowers first, and there are many perennials that are very important to pollinators. Research has shown that the very most important native plants for butterflies and moths are actually trees. And top among those is the oak, which in here in Seekonk hosts 473 different species of butterflies and moths. That is, it supports their entire life cycles. Next up is willows, like pussy willows, that support 399. And cherries, oh, cherries are a little more than the pussies. Cherries come in at 411. Goldenrods for your herbaceous perennials are the by far the most important. They support 125 species, and the asters are close behind at 110 species. If you or someone you know would like more information about turning a lawn into a pollinator garden, please get in touch. This is Carol Lundeen at Garden 911 Boston. Thank you for watching. Okay. Wow, that was fabulous. Thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not a videographer, as you can tell. <laughs> Just put my little phone on my tripod and and uh, and piece it together. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't care about being technically perfect, but I do. I'm passionate about sharing information about supporting our wildlife that supports us. Yes. So tell us how that works. Right. So, um, you know, part of my story is as a kid, I grew up on the Cape in the in the early 60s. Um, my family had a love of nature. And my favorite, one of my favorite birds was the chickadee. And I have since then learned that if you love birds, you need to support their entire life cycles. One pair of chickadees, when they're building their nest and you know having eggs in the nest and getting them all the way till they fledge, each pair of chickadees needs 400 to 600 caterpillars every single day to feed their babies. Where do caterpillars come from? They come from butter, adult butterflies and moths. Where do adult butterflies and moths lay their eggs so that the we can have caterpillars that feed the birds? Those, uh, so that this is why native plants are important because the birds and the bees have evolved since the retreat of the, the ice age, they've evolved into ecosystems. It, it's not a, you know, there, it's, it's not so much a, um, you know, you've, we've heard of the food chain since we were in, you know, middle school or something. <laughs> the food chain isn't really a chain, it's more of a web. And it's a, it's a complex system that has its own checks and balances. When the population of one species goes up, eventually it will be, there'll be a check and balance that that population will come down and another species will you know, it's, it's a, it's a self-regulating system, ideally. And so getting back to the, the chickadees, when you have an oak tree that supports almost 500 species of native uh, butterflies and moths, chances are that's where chickadees want to gonna have their nest or a cherry tree or a willow tree. Those trees are extremely, they're called keystone species because they support such a diversity of species of pollinators. So those keystone species, the oaks, the cherries, the willows, and then the, for the perennials, the, the golden rods and asters, those are the keystone anchors of the whole system. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. I, I have a, a really big oak in front of my house. And um, so it, it, there have been times when I, when I consulted an arborist to see if it was in good shape or should I have it removed. And um, he told me, no, you have some dead limbs near the top. But otherwise it's a very sturdy and healthy oak. So I'm happy to hear that it's not just for my pleasure, but it's for the um, propagation of uh, the birds. Right, and when you think about, you know, if one pair of tiny little birds needs thousands and thousands of caterpillars, what about the other chickadees? What about the other birds? Like there's the demand for, for caterpillars that are really, really, really efficient at turning plants into protein. That's why the birds like them so well, because caterpillars are so high protein. Mm -hmm. And then there are, as part of the system, 
the, the caterpillars, you know, they poop, their droppings go into the leaf litter on the ground. Uh, the, some of the caterpillars spend the winter or, or part of their life cycle in the leaf litter underneath, say, the oak trees. And there are other animals like foxes and frogs and salamanders and, you know, all kinds of animals that depend on caterpillars as part of the cycle of life, as part of the, the food web. <clears throat> so, um, so some of those caterpillars, uh, which winter over under leaves, um, are the food, is a staple food for foxes? Foxes, when they're hungry, they'll, they'll eat anything they can find. Mm -hmm. Would prefer a, a, a big juicy bunny, <laughs> but you know, they're yes, right. I know, I, I have bunnies under my shed. And now I only see two. <laughs> but a few days ago, my neighbor across the street took a photo of a fox in front of my garage. And she said she saw the fox in my garden in front of my house. And that's often where I see my, my two bunnies. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm only going to see one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was reading yesterday about voles which are kind of, they're little rodents. They're, they kind of resemble mice in a way, moles and voles. And I was reading how, how vicious they are and how their populations tend to be so high. And they're very, very, they're, they're in a way that they are also a keystone species because there are so many of them that support the, the raptor birds like to eat them. Um, the, the, the foxes and other, you know, mid, minimum, uh, medium to small size mammals like to eat them. It's mm -hmm. a whole, there's a whole world under the leaf litter that is, is rich in, in biological activity. And that, so is that, is that a reason uh, why we should not be doing the fall cleanup? Thank you for asking that. Yes. Um, so I'm someone uh, who's, uh, I guess you could say a deep ecologist. You know, when those deciduous trees like oak trees, when they drop their leaves in the late fall, those trees depend on those leaves breaking down over time to nourish, to put those nutrients back in, in, into themselves. It's the trees want to recycle their own resources. And not only that, but that those leaves on the ground, that leaf litter, that's habitat for numerous species that depend <clears throat> on that habitat to, to complete their life cycle. And when you eliminate that, you eliminate a habitat and you hurt the natural systems. And mm. so, you know, there's, there's some, this, many people seem to be wired to wanna to clean up their yards in the fall, but from a, from a wildlife and habitat point of view, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's not a, a best practice. No, and of course we all see those ads, uh, fall cleanup. And um, uh, Kim Zarella, who has retired now, but she had a uh, landscape uh, business uh, called um, Mother Earth. And she selected plants and, uh, for my garden that I put in front of the house. And she advised me not to do the fall cleanup. And so um, there is one downside to that um, because the oak tree this year had so many, uh, so many leaves and so many acorns. The acorn harvest was just amazing. I don't know why the squirrels didn't take, take them all, but if there's so many still there and I'm, I'm raking them up and uh, trying to dispose of them. But um, I spent, because of that, the fact that I, this particular uh, spring that I, because I didn't do the fall cleanup, I had so much more to do. And I have literally put in at least 50 hours and I'm still not finished uh, because of the accumulation of, of so many leaves. I guess um, I did my good deed. <laughs> well, do, do, uh, the, are these leaves getting on your lawn as well as your ornamental beds? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. right. 
the um, the oak is in front of the, it's just outside the picket fence and inside the picket fence is the garden. So leaves just fall. Uh, and because for some reason there was such an abundance uh, both of leaves and acorns this year, um, that I guess all those little critters had a nice, warm, safe little home over the winter. Indeed they did. <laughs> so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. So tell me, um, uh, can you give us some examples besides the goldenrod, which I've, now I'm not gonna pull that up. I mean, I, that, that was always a weed. This is a good weed. So, um, and can you, and the asters also, can you give us examples of other pollinators that we could put into our gardens? Right, and thank you for asking that. So um, I guess in my, in my learning, I, I came across the, uh, the, the needs of, of butterflies and moths, um, but there's also the other pollinators, you know, in addition to birds, like hummingbirds, there are the bees. We have, a, there's my dog. <laughs> uh, we have in Massachusetts, we have, I think approximately 125 species of native bees. And, you know, many of us, when we think about bees as pollinators, we think of the, the European honeybees that uh, are kept in, in hives and managed by farmers. And you know, those are very, very hardworking animals. But I, if I remember correctly, the pollinator efforts of our native bees far, uh, far, are far, far, far greater than the, the work of the, of the imported colonizing honeybees. And so the, the bees to complete their life cycles Turns out, you know, nature has its way of, of uh, being diverse. Our, our native bees like, tend to like a whole different set of plants than the butterflies and moths. For instance, for the bees, uh, St. John's wort is an extremely important plant. And there are many, I think there were maybe seven or eight native St. John's worts in our area. Some are uh, like the shrubby St. John's wort, some are more perennial like, some are crawling across the ground like vines. Hello, Harper, that's a good boy. There's my puppy, good boy. Harper's been, been, uh, been wanting to eat bees lately. He's, when, they're a bit, when a big bumble is overhead, he, he watches it and wants to catch it like the great hunter that he is, huh? My, my chocolate lab is lying on the rug at my feet. And having a nap, or he might be yapping too. <laughs> so, okay, so besides St. John's Wort, what other uh, would be helpful to bees? What other plants? Uh, I don't have that on top of my head, but I'd be happy to send it along so that Jason can include it in our notes. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so, so now when you design a pollinator garden, uh, do you group certain native plants together? Uh, I mean, is there a s science to that? You bet. There, the, uh, one of the most important parts of design is site analysis. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you have a corner that's really dry and really shady and the soil is such and such, such there's, mm -hmm. There can be a limited number of plants that really want to live there, right? So you want to, there are plants that want to live there, but you, you want to do some research and know what they are. It's really important to put the right plants in the right places. And because, you know, a set or, or of plants will do well in that micro neighborhood, that becomes a plant community because those plants do well there and they attract the insects and other wildlife that make that system tick. If you are in your front lawn and it's full sun and you want to turn that into pollinator gardens, you're, you're in a full sun situation. We have to look at how the soil drains, what the organic matter is, we'll want to do a soil test. So there's a completely different palette of plants that want to live and thrive there that will outcompete other plants for which that's not the best best environment. 
It was really important to do that assessment. My goodness, so there's science involved here. There is a lot of science, yeah. In fact, one of my favorite books uh, is Nature's Best Hope. It's by oh. Dr. Doug Talame. He's a doctor of insects at, uh, I think it's University of Delaware. And so this is a book that's kind of in pop culture. And his, the previous book of his that I know about is uh, Bringing Nature Home. And so it's interesting that, that he's an educator, you know, he's, he's at Delaware. So he's teaching people about gardens from an insect's point of view. Mm. I just think that it is so interesting that he, uh, and, and he has this model where, you know, as, as time goes on, as more of our woodlands uh, are taken down to install homes, he realizes that in order to save nature, our homes ought to be landscaped with native plants so that the, so that the, the impact of the fragmentation of the habitats that comes with, with clearing land and building homes is lessened to an extent. So the animals have connectivity so they can, they have a better chance of, of surviving. Mm -hmm. So, so wow. his thing is um, this homegrown, homegrown national park, I think he calls it. So he's, he's, he's not only a, an insectologist, he's a, he's a community builder. He's one of my, my many nature heroes. Wow. Okay, and of course we can get that on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So nature's best hope and bringing nature home. Correct. Yep. We also do have our. Do, uh, do we have a paperback junction? Is is that shop still open? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. we do on one thirty eight southeastern. Yep. Yes. I bet, I bet she could help us get these books also. Absolutely. Yeah. Good idea. So, um, do you have any parting comments that you want to make? Uh, uh, please to viewing audience about how important it is for them individually to do uh, uh, their parts in helping nature and sure. helping uh, actually human survival as well. It is because, um, you know, E.O. Wilson, the, um, the biologist who's, who's well known for studying ants, he will say that um, without humans, the ecosystem will recover and go on and thrive. But if we lose the insects, where he's an expert, he said human civilization will collapse within months. My. That's a short time period because insects are so critical to supporting all life, including people. I mean, if we think about, you know, people in our diets, just about everything we eat was once a plant. If you eat beef, what are those animals eating? They're eating plants. If you eat chicken, what are those animals eating? They're eating plants. Even, it's just, think of a moose in the woods in Western Mass or in Maine. Those are vegetarians. They don't need to eat other animals, other, to, to be really big, robust animals. So, and if we don't have any pollinators, we're not gonna have any plants. Mm -hmm because plants need to be pollinated in order to feed not only nature, but people. Now, you know, most of us have read about the mysterious death of uh, bees, pollinating bees uh, in, in the hundreds of thousands across the United States. Do you know what the current status of that is? Good question. I don't know. I think there are many, um, theories about it. I think there are, are scientists that are working hard on that. A lot of figuring that out is funding. I mean, scientists do their projects when their projects get funded and there's a lot of competition for research money. Mm. So there's that aspect. There is uh, something called colony collapse disorder. Um, and for some reason, you know, big numbers of bee colony, you know, imported European honeybees are collapsing. And I think there's probably a lot more to learn about it. It, it may well be exposure to 
agricultural pesticides and pesticides that you know we use in our own homes and lawns when we put down a weed killer in our lawn fertilizer that could be an impact on the bees i think you know, i think people in my opinion uh, we we it's kind of like medicine you know we know a lot but we don't we just our knowledge is on the tip of the iceberg these are very complex systems and um, it's, it's always exciting to keep learning. So your, your message also is against um, weed killers and herbicides and pesticides and all those toxins. Um, so organic vegetables, of course, are the way to go. We're fortunate to have Langwater Farm here. Um, and um, I, I still see so many perfect green lawns in Easton. So I know that they are using the pesticides and herbicides to create these very green, rich, fertile looking lawns. That's so, right. And, they, and they're very water dependent also. And, uh -huh. and I think the town just enacted a water, uh, a, a degree of watering ban recently. Yes. And so I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, each household can water just one day a week during a certain time range. And, you know, as climate change continues, if droughts continue, we had a very severe drought last fall. Um, these, these green lawns are not sustainable. Those grasses that are in those lawns are not native plants, they're not native grasses. Even Kentucky bluegrass doesn't even come from our continent. <laughs> no, it has that nice Kentucky name, but actually it's an exotic invasive plant. Uh, and so most people have these cool season grasses and, the, and what we need is warm season grasses that can thrive on their own without all these inputs of water and, and, and uh, conventional uh, fertilizers and weed killers. That's very interesting. Now, where can one buy warm, uh, what did you call them, warm cedar? Warm season native grasses. Yes, where do we get those? Lots of places. Um, one of my favorite resources is Grow Native Massachusetts. It's a nonprofit. Okay, Grow Massachusetts. Grow Native Massachusetts. Oh, grow Native Massachusetts. Yep. Okay. They're they're having a plant sale next month, as they, they always do. Um, Garden in the Woods at the Native Plant Trust in Framingham. They have uh, big growing operations. They have a sales area in Framingham, as well as at Nasami Farm in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So those are just you know two local places where I do a lot of business. Oh, you also, in the video, showed, is it Blue Farm? Right, Blue Moon Farm, yep. That is in South Kingstown, Rhode Island. So it's, I'm sorry, the full name is? Blue Moon Nursery. Oh, Blue Moon. Yes. Blue Moon, da, 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 that one? Yes. <laughs> Blue Moon Farm, okay. And that's in, in Rhode Island, what town? South Kingstown. South Kingston. Uh, town. Oh, South Kingstown, sorry. We have to be careful in Rhode Island because we have Kingston and Kingston. Right. And how far away is that for, for us here well, in Easton? It's about an hour and 15 minutes away. I, I was there recently because I was purchasing plants for my client in Seekonk. So that was yeah. the, the, native, the, the nearest nursery uh, mm -hmm. that, that had what we wanted. So we can go online and see what they have to offer. And if, if yep. there are items, uh, plants that we need, then we can uh, go and pick them up. Right. You know, so a, another thing about native plants is that they are increasingly in the news, in popular culture. Um, and so we want to be very careful when we purchase native plants because um, conventional growers in greenhouses, they, they're they have a profitability model and many of them 
um, what, what they're growing when they're growing native plants, they do a great job of providing jobs for, for growers and transportation companies and plants for consumers. However, many of the things that they grow are uh, clones of one another. So if you, if you picture a huge nursery operation that's growing, say, an entire greenhouse full of butterfly weed, the, the orange milkweed plant, chances are those are all clones. And the problem with that is because they're not genetically diverse, if some kind of insect or fungus or bacteria that come, comes through, it will probably kill most of those plants. Yes, there will be a few that survive, um, but what those are lacking is diversity. And you know, that's kind of a, a relatively new field of study about what, what is the impact of conventionally grown native plants. There's a woman in Vermont, Annie White is her name. Um, she is now a doctor of, of probably, I guess, um, botany. And her focus in her, in her work is measuring pollinator visits to a species, a genetically diverse individual versus individuals that were that are clones of one another. So she's done a, a lot of work in that. And in some species, it does make a difference. Mm. So wow, it is, it is more complicated I think, than any one of us imagined. Right. So we all want to, we all want to do, do well and do better. And we're all on a continuum, um, but just be aware of what you're buying mm -hmm. is what I would suggest. So in other words, it's so important to go to a place like Blue Moon Farm or to the garden in the woods, Framingham and uh, so forth. So, so maybe you might, at the end of this program, uh, we could post some of those places that you trust so that our, the plants that we purchase will survive and uh, protect our uh, all kinds of species, including us. us including people. us. <laughs> <laughs> I think people don't don't uh, realize that we're part of the continuum. Also, indeed. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Carol, for being with us today. Um, it's been wonderful and so educational, and I've learned so much. Um, and I'm sure that our viewing audience has too. And so we thank you for the video. We thank you for all of uh, the wonderful information that you've imparted today. And uh, hopefully that you'll be able to join us again and bring us more valuable information. That would be delightful, Priscilla. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, it's always great to meet people and, and start conversations. And, you know, one, one parting, idea is that if all of us can make a difference, if we make one small change, if we replace one exotic plant with one native plant, we've done a great job. We can start small. And keep yes. Yes. And I think that it's so important to teach our children that too, because they are the future. Indeed. Yes. Okay. So thank you again. And um, Tell me, uh, how can people get in touch with you um, for your services if they want to put in a pollinator garden or they want some design? Oh, and let's not forget that you designed at the town offices on Elm Street, beautiful gardens, one at the entrance uh, off of Elm Street and one in front of the entrance to the town offices. Uh, they're just beautiful. And what kind of plants did you put in there? Right, thank you for mentioning that. At the flagpole bed, I call that the, the uh, you know, where you walk into the building, it's a round bed. So right in front, we have a memorial stone, um, which kind of anchors it. And around the ground cover is uh, uh, cat mint, it's called. It's a perennial. It has blue, blue flowers that bloom a long time. Now. Mm. It is not a native plant, but it is a bee and pollinator magnet. So it's a very common plant used in a commercial and industrial traffic island type situations. 
Right behind that, we have variegated red twig dogwoods. Now it's true the variegated red twigs are not uh, the species, they are a cultivar, um, but they do bloom, they make berries, they, they attract pollinators. So I, I, I felt that that was a, a good choice for that spot. We have native grasses like little blue stem uh, that have done very well there. Uh, we also tried, sorry, I'm on a timer here, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. Um, we have some, uh, some of the, we did try a couple of non-native grasses and sure enough, they failed. We've, we've lost quite a, quite a few of them, but the native grasses, the little blue stems have done very well. Out by the street at the entry triangle, uh, those, those conditions are tough there. At, at the flagpole, the town was able to install drip irrigation, which was extremely important in getting those new plantings established. But out at the entry triangle, there is no water at all. No irrigation, the nearest spigot is, it's an effort. You know, the garden club members who are maintaining that, it's quite an effort to get water out there. So finding plants that are really drought tolerant that can stand snow and salt being dumped on them, um, it, it can be challenging there. We do have some little blue stems there. We have quite a few brown-eyed Susans that have done very well and are starting to colonize the area. There's also quite a bit of the, the Nepeta, the, um, the cat mint out front. And we did have a dogwood tree there, um, but that has, has passed away and it's not been replaced yet. And when it does get replaced, we're gonna need volunteers to, to help water it for a year or two. You know, it's gonna take about an inch of water every week until the ground freezes up to get it established. So it's, it's one thing to, to put plants in, but in the long run, maintenance is everything. Hmm. So is the dogwood uh, an appropriate pollinator? Um, good question. So it, it's not on the top, it probably is not in the top 10%. Well, let me, let me restate that. It's not in the top 10 list of most important pollinator plants or um, bees, butterflies, or moths. Um, but, you know, it is a nice woodland plant that was doing a, a lovely job there. I'm not sure why it succumbed, but it, but it did. I'm thinking something that would be nice there would be something like a shad bush. Um, that blooms nice and early in spring. They can bloom in shade, in sun, in drought, in wet. They're very, they're very resilient shrub. That's called shag bush? Shad, S-H-A-D. Shade, oh shad, S-H-A-D. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, I'm writing all this down. Okay. And is it important to get that shad bush at a place like Blue Moon Farm? Um, well, scientifically, uh, I was unable to find any research about uh, pollinator visits uh, for that particular species. Um, okay. So it's kind of a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> okay, but, well, I wouldn't call it a crapshoot. You have systematically outlined in a very scientific way a lot of what's important for us to know so that we can help nature help itself. And we appreciate so much your being here. So again, thank you. And for those of you who are watching, we hope you've enjoyed this show. Uh, you hear my chocolate lab who is in the background now getting very um, uh, edgy about why he hasn't gone on his walk today. So I'm gonna sign off Priscilla um, Dolson. And until next time, Stay well, stay safe. Thank you.